Okay, so you, you should all be able to see that, I hope. We can. Uh, great. Okay, great. So, so, so hi there. So, uh, yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about some of my experiences with South African plants in the Western Cape, and the sort of, you know, the, the what what I've done in, in my lifetime, I guess, is I've I've actually tried to explore most of the interesting temperate and Mediterranean parts of the world from a plant point of view, uh, and so South Africa, I, I spent bet between about 2005 and about 2018. 2019, you know, I very regularly visited South Africa, looking at plants in the wild, uh, worked on some of the plants uh, with PhD students. And, and really what I was interested in doing was all about, we, I was interested in South African vegetation from a point of view of climate change. Um, if you look at somewhere like London, for example, London, the, the best current predictions for London is that London will re resemble the climate of present day Barcelona. Uh, by by 20, 2050. And so it, uh, South African plants seem to be, uh, you know, a reasonably good bet. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that as we go through the presentation. So that's where I was coming from. But obviously, I'm interested in, in uh, South African plants in general, you know, as garden and landscape plants too. But the, this, this talk is a little bit, it's got a little bit of a pitch really for me as university research scientist. Um, and I'm not going to talk about by cultivation and detail, uh, I'll leave that to you. Uh, but I'm going to talk very much about the sort of habitats and some of the characteristics of the things uh, and which might be useful to you if from the point of view of, of trying to grow these things. Uh, so, so one of the critical things to understand about South Africa is, is that you know, people talk about South Africa as if it, it's a sort of a uniform place, or they certainly do in the UK. Uh, but of course, South Africa is really a very non-uniform place. So if we look at, uh, if we look at, oops. Um, so if we look at the, um, the rainfall patterns, uh, the eastern part is summer rainfall. I don't know why some winter rainfall hasn't come up on the, on the, on the southwestern side, but it, it should do, but it hasn't. Uh, and the bit we're going to talk about today is the western, the western Cape which is uh, pretty much entirely a, a winter rainfall climate, i.e. a classic Mediterranean climate uh, with, with dry summers and uh, uh, wet autumn through to spring. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we're actually going to look at. Uh, and one, of the, one of the interesting characteristics of South Africa is it for, for a relatively small population base, um, it's got a remarkably good botanical infrastructure and lots of people writing on the flora. Mm. Um, so if you really want to know more about the South African vegetation, now I have to say, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the writing on the South African flora is driven by the Anglos, uh, by the people of the, of the UK. And so therefore, historically, their main focus has been on the Eastern species, the summer rainfall species, which tend to have higher, higher altitude distributions and therefore tend to be more cold tolerant. So that's really been the British interest. Um, and there's less written really, you know, I mean, obviously there's a lot of interest in, particularly in California in South African species. Um, but on the whole, you know, there's, there's, there's not such an extensive literature uh, from looking at the, this vegetation from the Mediterranean aspect. Uh, one book I really would recommend very strongly, uh, but only if you're seriously interested in the vegetation, is the one on the top left, which is an enormous great tome of a thing. You know, you could sort of, you know, almost need a wheelbarrow to push it around. Uh, the Vegetation of South Africa, Lesotho and Swaziland. And this is a, an extraordinary sort of compilation of the vegetation communities of South Africa. A fantastic thing, but again, only for people who are really, really interested. If you're just interested in um, South African vegetation, say from a Mediterranean point of view, the, the field guide to Fimbos is a pretty good one. So that might be my starting point uh, if I was thinking, uh, looking at the species I'm going to primarily going to be talking about in this talk. So there's lots of information. Um, okay, so why, you know, how, how, how did I do stuff? Well, I, I guess uh, I, I have a great debt of gratitude. Right. Here to Rod and Rachel Saunders. Uh, Rod and Rachel uh, were the people who set up and ran Silver Hill Seeds. So Silver Hill Seeds were the, the I mean, they still exist, but uh, they were a rather diminished version to what they once were. 
Silver Hill, so Ron and Rachel run Silver Hill Seeds, and they they spent most of their their time, their life, sort of driving through South Africa, collecting seeds, uh, which they then sold through Silver Hill Seeds. Uh, and so I, I I I made sort of contact with them in probably about two thousand and ten, and so and we started a quite a long sort of collaboration, and we we travelled together and. Uh, so they gave me a fantastic opportunity to share their knowledge with me. Sadly, they were murdered by some um, some Islamic State sort of wannabes in, 20, in 20, uh, 2019, 2018, sorry. Uh, so um, none were with us, and uh, it's only purely chance I wasn't with them. So that was that was quite a fortuitous thing. So it's very, very sad. But anyway, they, you know, just really recording my gratitude to them they had the most extraordinary knowledge of the south african of the south african flora um okay so what about the winter rainfall community so so in some ways species from these have better fit with the changing uk climate because the the typical pattern in the uk is we're going to move from a year-round rainfall where we get about 50 millimeters or 60 millimeters in every month that's pretty much how it historically has been to very much to a uh, a preponderance of rainfall in the winter in the winter months between between September and and March in in the northern hemisphere. Um, so, in many ways, species from this southwestern corner, you know, in many ways would fit better with our future climate than the ones from the southeast of of South Africa. However, the main issue with a lot of the species from from the Western Cape is cold tolerance. So many of these species cannot tolerate uh, temperatures very well below minus three to minus four centigrade because they're growing at the, during the winter months. So they're very, very sensitive. Um, now, obviously, my, so, so the challenge for me really was to see, could we find species in that flora, you know, which were far more cold tolerant. So that was the big drive for me. Uh, as well as thinking about how could you then assemble these plants in plant communities, because I sort of make this ecologically based vegetation. So it's not like having a patch of A and a patch of B. It's much more about sort of integration of species with one another. Um, now, the, one of the really interesting things about the Western Cape, why was I interested in it? It's, it's just about the richest flora in the temperate and Mediterranean world. So about 13,000 species occur in the Western Cape in an area the same as the UK. And the UK has a thousand species. Now the UK is particularly impoverished in terms of plant species, just about the most impoverished nation state in the world actually. Um, and that's because of the ice age. Um, so the, the Western Cape is super botanically rich. And of course, only a tiny amount of that vegetation has actually been explored from a horticultural point of view. So there's an enormous opportunity still to explore this flora for and particularly for gardens in Mediterranean climates where this winter temperature is not such a, not such an issue. So these species basically come from two main, broadly speaking, two main large scale plant communities. The first one is Fimbos, which you know crudely translated means something like firebush in 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 in, in um, uh, in um, uh, I've got a senior citizen moment in African African Africans yeah thank you um, uh, and then you have Resnostaveld which essentially translates as rhinoceros bush um, which is found on clay based soils and this is very very geophyte rich so you've got these two communities Fimbos is still very well represented in South Africa Rhinosteveld is very very, very reduced. In fact, Rhinostabel is most Rhinostabel is very much under threat of extinction because it grows on clay-based soils, which support the South African wine industry and Ruribos tea industry. So it's been not so good for the Rhinostabel, but uh, uh, hey ho. Um, so here, Rod and Rachel. So this is this is us actually hiking, looking for plants in the uh, the mountains near uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, one of the characteristics of when you're looking at plants in the wild there is, um, oh yeah, so this is, okay, so that's, that's typical montane fimbos uh, on, on sandy soil, so very nutrient poor, uh, subject to fire, uh, cycles of between six and 20 years, uh, very severe burn, so it's a fire ecosystem, 
and the plants are very adapted to that sort of environment. In fact, without fire, you lose species diversity quite quickly, as you do in almost any Mediterranean climate. Uh, this is uh, this is by contrast. This is Rhinostevel, so this is on shale or clay-based soils, and it's in the the dominant the dominant plant there is Rhinoceros bush. That's the grey sort of shrub. Uh, but this is again very very geophyte rich, bulb rich. And so opposed to fire, these, these are quite extraordinary places. And this, this is quite high, high altitude in Osterveld. Um, okay, so we were interested in these species as future climate change uh, species. Uh, and you know, what, we, what we often do is, you know, this is, you don't, we don't have to really process this, but I just left it in the presentation. But this, this, is, this is just comparing British cities in terms of the growing season with some of the eastern locations in the eastern South Africa. So this is summer rainfall stuff. And you see you've got Sunny Pass there in the southern Drakensberg. Uh, and you can see it's pretty similar to uh, in during the growing season in terms of uh, uh, growing season temperatures and precipitation. So this stuff fits pretty well with the UK at the moment, fit less well in the future as the rainfall patterns shift. Doesn't fit so well with the northern Drakensberg where it's uh, the summers are much warmer. And much much wetter, um, and then you have uh, the Cape Town comparisons. Um, and what I'm doing here, I'm comparing growing season in South Africa with which is which is obviously um, the winter months of sort of uh, March. Well, so let's say May May to May to October, and I'm with the uh, April to September in uh, the, the sorry for the UK because these. Winter growing species primarily grow in summer in the UK, or certainly yeah, they're pushed a bit more from, from winter into spring and sometimes summer. So I'm trying to make these comparisons really, <laughs> uh, but that's probably not of enormous interest to you. But hey, ho, let's, uh, let's just move on. Um, so what were we trying to do? I'll just introduce, uh, sorry, just interrupt you. I think there's somebody who's got their speaker on and it's causing a little bit of disturbance. Please just all check that you've got yourselves with a red line through your um, microphone on the screen. Iro, echo, grazie, Iro, grazie. Okay, I think now go, James. I think. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay, so what we were doing is, you know, so we, so in this work, so what I did initially is, you know, rather than just wander around and saying, oh, that looks nice, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, you know, I, I probably went to South Africa, oh, I probably, I don't know, 15, 20 times over a, in a 10 year period, often for a couple of weeks at a time, looking, traveling hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers. So this was a fairly serious pursuit. And, you know, we're all super fit. So, you know, we'd, we'd walk up a thousand meters every day looking at plants because, you know, most of the species I was interested in were on the tops of mountains, not at the lowlands. And, and so what we, so what I did initially is I, I, I sort of spent quite a lot of time looking at the flora from all the resources and I sort of made lists of the species I thought we would be really useful from as garden or landscape plants, rather than the sort of pin in the tail on the donkey, which most plant introductions are around. This was, I, I was strategic. And so I had a list of species, like pri prime species I wanted to find and find high altitude populations of. So what we would then try to do is through Rod and Rachel, We've then tried to find a seed from as many different geographical and altitudinal populations as possible. Uh, we grow large numbers of seedlings of these at Sheffield as in, on, on, on the, under research conditions, 100 minimum for each population. Uh, we'd subject them to winter cold or soil wetness, so we're, we're trying to kill them basically, because um, we're interested in the ones that survive. Um, so that we kill most of the seedlings. Uh, and then we grow on the survivors, and these are individuals with the, the sort of cold tolerant genes to flowering size. And then we produce seed from these individuals for use in research and practice. Uh, and then we run the process again. And then at the end of the process, we end up with a range of species, which we might be able to then utilize in designed landscapes. So that's the general, the general sort of process. Uh, and so the, the really cold areas now again if you're sat if you're sat on the coast of you know Puglia then you know you're not going to be very interested in this high altitude stuff but obviously if you're somewhere much colder than you you you, you might well be so if you're in the Californian 
some bits of California, which are relatively cold, this, this stuff would be interesting to you. So the areas we were really interested in uh, were these. So the Kamisberg, which is a, 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 a granite range quite far north, so but at about 2000 meters, and then the Roggeveld Plateau, which is inland away from the sea, um, about um, 1200 to 1800 meters, but flat with frost, high altitude frost pockets. So really interesting uh, opportunities. The Hex River Mountains, uh, sort of which are high and cold, again, quite inland away from the coast, from the effect of the coast. And then finally the Schwartberg and Kamenassi Mountains uh, down on the south the south coast, where you're beginning to move a little bit more into a sort of a rainfall every month of the year sort of climate. So that's where we were looking. And, you know, if you want to know what the Roggeveld looks like, the Roggeveld looks like that. Um, it's high altitude, it's relatively dry, it's very cold in winter. So Sutherland goes to minus, minus 16, minus 17 degrees, minus 16 to minus 17 centigrade in winter. That's the coldest on record. So this is, this is a very cold landscape and it's very hot and dry in summer and it's very cold and moderately wet in winter. So it's a real extreme, uh, sort of eerily, hauntingly beautiful landscape. And those stars, my God, those stars. Wow, uh, what a place. Um, anyway, um, so what we did, this is just from a little, a little thing we published. We wrote, a, we, we wrote a little paper on this in the, uh, uh, in the Plantsman what's now called the plant review, the RHS sort of like upmarket plant journal. And we, we, and we, were, we were really comparing seedlings from these, all these different collection points uh, to see how they performed. And, in, and what you find is, you know, what you find is here we, here we are, here's our, some of our pots with seeds in them. Uh, we've sown them. We're gonna then expose these to varying degrees of coldness in different environments. And we, we sort of count the survivors and then Take it, take it from there type thing. And so, you know, by about spring 2012, we'd screened about 500 species uh, for tolerance of winter cold and summer wetness. Um, and there's a, there's a thesis in the University Library at Sheffield, which is probably digitized now by uh, a, a person called Ye, ha Ye Hang, that's Y-E, that's her first name, Hang, H-A-N-G, so you can read about this in that thesis. I'm pretty sure it will be digitized and you'll be able to access it if you went to the university website. Um, okay, so, so here, here's a species. This is Ixia curvata, a very high altitude Ixia. Uh, that's been, so that this takes minus 10, minus 12 without any problems at all, even as very young seedlings. So there were some really interesting species came up uh, and what you find is, if you look at a very common species like Watsonia bourbonica, um, you know, it goes all the way from the coast right the way to about 1400 and 1500 meters. The coastal populations are killed at minus one, minus two in the UK. The populations we found at 1400 meters take minus six to minus eight to minus 10. So, it, the, so the site of collection, as with all plants, hugely influences the capacity of those plants to tolerate heat, cold, dryness, whatever. So you, you have to think of really sensibly about plants as populations, not as species. Species is really a bit of a meaningless concept uh, in many ways type thing. Uh, so here's, here's, this is uh, Arctotus adpressa, again, another high altitude species, just young seedlings, but again, they, these take minus 12, no, no problems at all type thing. So there's capacity within the flora to find things which are really um, are, are really useful, say, for the, for the UK and other parts of Western Europe. Um, and so what we're going to do with this vegetation is we wanted to really ultimately use as multi-layer communities. So what we typically have in these is we'd have a, a ground layer, perhaps mainly Asteraceae, mostly evergreen. And then coming out of that, we have an emergence, some dormant geophyte layer, potentially many species. And then we have an emergent summer evergreen structural geophyte layer coming out of that to give a long term sort of sense of, you know, so it looks, it looks pretty good. OK. And if you look at the work that Marco Scano is doing with me, uh, he's using Southern European, Australian and, um, and, and South African species pretty much to, to, to create this similar sort of vegetation. But he's doing that in Sardinia. So you'll hear, I'm sure you'll hear much more about that in the future. 
Um, oh, I don't need to worry about this. And it, on our experimental stuff, you know, we were quite interesting in, in cutting down and flash burning in early autumn, just before most of these species start growing again. Uh, and you might think that's really weird, but of course all these species are highly adapted to fire. Uh, and it's a useful, useful technique, especially if you're thinking about potentially large and you know we don't just set fire to it like i'm having a bushfire you know you cut it down and you flash burn it with a, a propane a propane burner from from a hire shop uh so it's, it's very controlled and safe and tame uh so this is the sort of things we were doing and the first species to kick off would be things like amaryllis belladonna uh which would kick off in early in late september and then the show would then go on uh through the uh, through the winter months and would you know you can you can push these things to about may june in the uk climate and after that it begins to look a bit sad um right okay so here's here's a here's a a, a helper this is jing yu kai uh chinese uh, the husband of, of yay heng so he's been given the job to do some work on the plots and here we see we're synthesizing these communities and you can see some of the asteraceae the Bersinias and Gazanias and uh, Dimorphothecas in these in these plots to his left type thing. Okay, so the thing to understand about this flora really is, is that you know fire is really critical to the ecology of many of these Western Cape species. So how they behave in cultivation, you know, it's all it's all a memory of actually how they normally appear, how what they do in the wild. So this is this is two weeks after a fire. And you can just see a little spot of red in the slide in the uppermost part of the image. Uh, and here we go. So 14 days after flowering, Brunsvegia marginata is already in flower. So these species are so cued by fire. And you, know, and you think that fire is devastation, but you know, this, these, these post-fire sites in South Africa are extraordinary in the two years after 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 a fire they are the, they are just the most amazing magical gardens but without fire you just get dominance by one or two shrub species eventually so these things need fire and just a close up you know so this brunswick marginata is a, is a, is a, is a fantastic species if you're in mediterranean climates um, so something uh, i don't know if that's in cultivation in the mediterranean but it's, it's certainly uh, an amazing amazing plant to to to, to use um, now, you don't understand about, about fire is, uh, particularly for shrubs and perennials, is that uh, there's, there's two ways in which South African uh, shrubs and perennials respond to fire. Uh, all, of, all of the geophytes, of course, when they burn, they just re-sprout from the, from the bulb or the corm or the tuber. But for shrubs and herbaceous plants, uh, some of them are killed by the fire and then reseed. Uh, and others, they re-sprout from the tissues below ground. So proteocyanoroides, for example, the king, king protea, here in its habitat in the Kamenasi berg, um, these, this is a, a post-fire re-sprouter. So it's burnt off and then it shoots back. So these plants are essentially immortal. And this is really important to know because if you're a post-fire re-sprouter, you can just be pruned off at the base at regular intervals and you can just completely regrow the canopy again and these plants are essentially immortal and you can keep them tidy and attractive just by using severe pruning as a as a, as a proxy for fire and keep regenerating these things so in the literature of mediterranean plants uh, in the garden literature this is never referred to but it's but it's so you know i i'm i'm an australian citizen as well as the british citizens so i've lived in australia for a long time and in, in Melbourne, for example, you know, people, most of, the, most of the shrubs, people use the Australian shrubs, they're mostly post-fire cedars, so you can't prune them severely. And so people clip them and they're very labor intensive and then they look really ugly and you can't regenerate them. So it's rather bizarre that this ecological understanding is never really caught on in the garden literature, but it's absolutely fundamental to understanding how to use Mediterranean species sensibly uh, and, and, and how you can treat them. Um, okay, so just by contrast, here's Lacertia frutescens, you know, on the Comsberg, which is a, a very cold mountain uh, on the Roggeveld. It's a receder, a post-firing receder, so the plant's killed by fire, it doesn't regenerate, and it regenerates by seed. Uh, so these just get increasingly scruffy with time, uh, difficult to regenerate by pruning. So it's a really important distinction. I, ho hope, I hope, you, hope you're 
you're getting that sort of sense. And, and actually in Southern Europe, Southern Europe has a much higher percentage of receders than many other Mediterranean climates. So, which is a bit of a problem. And they're all sisters of receders. So you, virtually none of them can really be severely pruned because that's just not part of the ecological strategy. They don't know how to respond. They don't maintain buds and the old tissues because they're just waiting to burn and die. Um, can I just ask, sorry, I'll just, sorry, uh, when, when, when um, it's a, re, a re-sprouter, you yeah. say it comes from underneath. Uh, yeah. can you just explain that a little clearer. They have a, a most, many species have a woody structure called a lignotuber. Oh. And it's where they store carbohydrates in. It's just like a underground storage thing. Uh, and when the top is burnt off, because soil is very thermally inert, there's, the lignotube is not killed even in the most severe fires. And those, those lignotubers are covered by buds. And as soon as the, the top has been burnt off, the buds come into, into growth. And hey, presto, the plant is regenerated. Thank you. Yeah. A very common thing in, in Mediterranean ecosystems. Mm. Okay, so, so to find interesting things, you know, we have to do a lot of climbing and uh, Rod, Rod was a, uh, a mountaineer. So even when he was in his 70s, he, he, he's, he was a bugger to keep up with, like a billy goat going up mountains. And of course, one of the things about the Western Cape Mountains where you find a lot of the existing diversity, because a lot of the sort of ground level has gone you know, the, the low altitude stuff's massively changed by agriculture. Um, so you have to go high to find really intact vegetation. Uh, you have to walk up those bloody hills type thing. And some of the really interesting, this is the Hex, the Hex River range. This is a really interesting range. Very little explored and it's incredibly difficult to move through. There's no water. And so when you walk in there, you have to protect enough water with you to get out. <laughs> Otherwise you die. Uh, no one's going to come and get you. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a challenging environment. So one of the reasons the South African vegetation really, in terms of these sorts of places, not very well known, is because there aren't many people who are signed up to do these sorts of things. And on these cliffs, you get, for example, uh, very cold tolerant populations of aloe hemanthifolia. This has just been transferred to another genus, but I'm still calling them aloes. I, I like it. I like to think of this as an aloe. And this is on, on, on rock faces, shady rock faces. These are about, about uh, two feet, 600 millimeters across and scarlet flowers, an ama amazing plant. And here they are growing on these these extra these vertiginous uh, rock faces um, so this plant uh, I grow this in Sheffield it, it just about survives outside and I, it, I'm hoping it'll be a major plant in my new garden in the south um, so a fantastic species very very long lived these plants are probably centuries old um, and of course one of the nice things about doing this stuff you get to visit and stay in the most extraordinary places so this is a mountain hut on the top of the hex and sleeping outside, extraordinary, extraordinary experiences. Uh, and of course, sometimes you just have to sleep out in the veld because you you're too far to get anywhere. So this is me moaning because I heard leopards in the night. And <laughs> sort of, I assume, and Rod and Rachel saying, get it gripped. Yeah, they're only small leopards. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, so it was very cold too. Um, okay, so this is fimbos, and this is showing the typical ericoid shrub structure. This is Lycodendron fimbos on a Kochelberg, which is a very, very biologically rich. And so these, these, these heathlands here, these fimbos heathlands, you know, they are incredibly species rich. I mean, far more so than, say, the Southern European stuff is. Um, you know, there's, there's, this is literally the peak of shrub evolution on planet Earth in terms of diversity. Fantastic, amazing, amazing places. Um, and what you get is you have this sort of typical either an Ostervel or Fimbos, and then you get fire and you get temporary uh, elimination of the shrub canopy. And then you get this explosion of herbaceous plants and geophytes. So this is mainly what's on your Bobonica, just, just, just inland from Cape Town. But it's a transient thing. About, after about three years, the shrubs will reassert themselves. And the 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 the, the, the geophytes sort of go into a sort of dormant stage and eventually disappear until the next fire event. So this is Rhinostervel post fire, just a few months after fire, clay-based soils, babianas, various lacanalias, 
And when you get a close up, you can just see, you can see the dead stems of the uh, of the shrubs. I don't know what they were, probably probably uh, rhinoceros bush, uh, lalapapas. Uh, and you can just see the amount of, even after a few weeks, the amount of diversity, oxalis, babianas, various shrubs, small sh re-sprouting shrubs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's fantastic. So when we used to go, we used to follow the fires. Wherever there'd been a fire the previous year, we would go to those sites uh, because that's where you saw the most extraordinary vegetation. Uh, so you get things like this, you know, so this is Hesperantha porciflora, the pink thing. Uh, this is in um, yeah, New, New Vauteville in uh, about an hour and a half north of Cape Town. On, this is Rhinosterveld on clay-based soils. Um, and this is on the, uh, this, is, this is Ye Heng, uh, sort of the woman with the green jumper on. She was the PhD student. Uh, and this is the top of the Commsburg. So it looks a bit like Scotland, only uh, it's rather drier. Uh, but again, this is very species rich, sort of semi-arid vegetation. So lots of interesting plants here. So, you know, Gazania, Krebsiana. So, you know, we think of, well, in the UK, we think of Gazania as a very short lived species, but these species are very long lived. They've been, this particular uh, population has been living on my green roof in Sheffield now in 75 millimeters of crushed brick with no irrigation for the last 10 years uh, and cut, cut does its stuff every year. But the whole landscape is painted orange with these sorts of species in, in, in the Comsburg. And then there are things like Bulbonella. So this is Bulbonella nutans, and this is in a swale. Most Bulbonellas, or many Bulbonellas, have wet, are found in wet situations. Um, this is this is Bulbonella nutans is a sort of fairly small species, about 600 millimeters tall in flower max. And this is just like a swale on the Roggeveld. Uh, very variable. Lots of this, this sometimes white, sometimes yellow, sometimes tall, sometimes short. And this is a, if you were wanting to grow a particular one in the Mediterranean, uh, these are winter growing plants. Bulbana latifolia var doloritica is like a sort of tangerine or orange. These are about a meter tall. And this is quite a rare species now. So it's very difficult to obtain seed of this. Not so cold tolerant, so not much use to me in Sheffield. Go to about minus two, minus three, uh, but a, fantas a fantastic species, like a really, again, like an emerus, get it out eventually, James, type thing. Um, and so, so, the, so, the, so what I'm going to do now on, I'm going to look at some species just organized into what, what you might call structure. So sort of things you might want to, you know, what's their shape and form in terms of uh, using them in design? Because, um, you know, as well as, doing this sort of biological, ecological stuff. I, I am a designer. And so, this is, so I, I think this is a useful way to think about these things. So you've just got two species here. This is, this is the, this very nice Gazania, Gazania othonites. This is grown on saline clays, and it's got this wonderful, dense sort of, sort of domes, about sort of 100 millimetres tall, 600 millimetres across. Uh, the orange is just Krebsiana. Um, fantastic plant, uh, but I've never been able to. Uh, Gazania othonites never really worked. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, James. That's all right. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Oh, uh, and then uh, there's a whole range of other gazanias that are at all those areas. Lots of different ones. Very difficult to identify actually sometimes. But the gazania lipoldii uh, further north in the in the area around the Camisberg. Very very nice sort of dark orange flowers and very nice foliage. Again, very drought tolerant, these species, obviously. I mean, these, these species would all come through a Mediterranean summer without, without irrigation. Uh, I mean, some of them might go dormant, but you, you certainly won't, they don't need irrigation to, to live, uh, to persist. Uh, and then something that looks like is that Gazania, but it's actually an Arctotus, uh, Arctotus campanulata with Babiana cuneata. Um, so, uh, you, so, you know, there's a lot of these really, really, interesting species. Uh, Romuleas, uh, this is Romulea comsbergensis, which grows in, in winter, winter wetlands, very on wet, very heavy wet clays, big pink flowers. This is very good in the Northern Hemisphere. It's very good in Sheffield. It's a great species, but there's a whole range of really fascinating Romuleas. Uh, here it is in its habitat. You can see it's growing in the water on the top of these high altitude plateaus. Um, other species, uh, one of the odd things you find when you do this work, you find species really you wouldn't expect to be very cold tolerant are. So this is Hesperantha vaginata. 
And we found this species to be surprisingly cold tolerant, uh, even though it, you wouldn't expect that from its distribution, which is quite low altitude. But it's all just part of the evolutionary history of some of these things. Yeah, this might might have lived in the in, in the past at much higher altitudes, and, and therefore it still got the genetic information in its in in the can on how to actually cope with say minus six or minus seven. It never experiences those temperatures in its habitat anymore. Uh, and then you we move up from these low things to things which are a bit more structural, perhaps hummock, evergreen forbs and shrubs, emergent, some are dormant, plus evergreen geophytes. So a really nice species. Um, it's this dome forming Dimorphotheca nudicrawlers, forms these little buns, about 300 millimeters tall, long flowering, very, very nice, very nice plant. But again, I don't think it's actually cultivated in Southern Europe. The thing to understand is, is that, you know, what we have in, in nurseries and that in the Mediterranean parts of the world, it's not part of this strategic process of saying, well, what's out there? Let's look through Manning's book on Fimbos and let's identify the species that looks super interesting or super attractive. It's very much a more random what, what might have happened in the past. So what we really need in all this is to have a more strategic view and people to say that's the species we really want to have. Uh, so a lot of aristeas. Uh, aristeas quite, you know, they don't fly for very long, but they're rather sort of non pareils when they do. So this is Aristea juncifolia, just a little one with very big flowers on the Hex River Mountains. Very, very nice species. Um, I like, but for me, Aristea is in. Tiny kind of little thing up there. Mm -hmm. George, can you be quiet, please? Mute yourself, George Flander. Yes. Thank you. Um, so again, you know, so with, with us in, in, in Sheffield, they, these are very prone to uh, a, a disease which causes blackening of the of the leaves. So they're a bit of a, they, they just don't work. But Marco tells me he also gets the same in 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 Sardinia. So, uh, but anyway, so there you go, perhaps to discuss at the end. And then there's a whole range of Watsonias. I mean, you know, we it, certainly in an Australian context, everyone sees Watsonias as extremely aggressive, weedy species. But of course, that's a complete falsehood. There are weedy, aggressive Watsonias, and there are non-weedy Watsonias. Uh, this idea that a genus, every plant in a genus, like rhododendron, is invasive is complete nonsense. Uh, completely un-ecologically informed view of the world. So Watsonias have some colonial species, which are the problem species. And then it has species which just form these small tufts, like Watsonia spectabilis, when the, the size of the flowers in relation to the plant is, an, is so, so extraordinary. Uh, it, it, amazing, amazing plant, but not very cold on, but, but very, this will be a, a, a fantastic species for Southern European landscapes. Uh, this is a really weird plant. This is Moria pendula, about a meter tall, from the top of the Kamisberg, just found on the top of a few, few small mountains. Uh, very restricted distribution, but for us in Sheffield, this seeds like crazy and is actually very extraordinarily, has great joie de vivre, really. Um, and of course, it's remarkably attractive to na native invertebrates, which they had never evolutionarily met. So the invertebrates rather like Maria Pendula, the, native, the UK native uh, invertebrates. Um, and then we have things like uh, Bulbanella nutans, which you saw before, and this is on growing and, and high altitude belts. So these plants will be very cold tolerant. And you get a sense of the drama of these sort of species in the wild. One of my favorite Bulbanellas is this one. This is Bul Bulbanella aberniflora, um, and creamy white, grayish leaves, uh, very, very beautiful species, about 600, 700 millimeters tall. Uh, so I, re I really, really like this species. I think it's fantastic, but it's not in cultivation as far as I'm aware in Southern Europe or anywhere else for that matter. I have, I have quite a large number in, in my glass house. Um, and one of the species from a Northern Hemisphere perspective that I'm really, really interested in is Gladiolus cardinalis because it's such a spectacular species and it's actually very easy to grow. Uh, certainly in northern northern temperate environments, goes to about minus minus ten, a bit prone to being killed below that. And this is just in my my Sheffield garden uh, in June, June July, 
Um, and we were interested in this species because most pops go up to about 1400 meters. Um, but what we have, what we did find, or what Rod and Rachel found, to be honest, and I, I went to have a look at with them, were these high altitude populations. So this is on the highest mountain in the Western Cape, the Matusberg. And on the right there, that, that, that grassy vegetation, that is, that is uh, Gladiolus cardinalis uh, on organic debris on these very steep slopes, which lead to death. Uh, so <laughs> that's weird. it's sort of, uh, yeah. So my, I don't think my university risk assessment will have covered that. Um, given that, you know, there's a, a thousand meter drop um, if you slip. Anyway, there you go. Long time to think about it going down. Um, anyway, um, we survived. We both survived. Um, OK, so then there's, there's more Watsonias. Uh, so this is Watsonia schlechteri. This is a very nice evergreen species. Again, not aggressive. Um, it's, it's a little bit colonial, but this is all by self-seeding. It doesn't, doesn't spread. It forms little tight, tight plants. This is post-fire on Dutoit du uh, Pass, not too far from Cape Town. Orangey scarlet, pure scarlet in some populations. And I think this is a species that Marco Scano is interested in. Uh, but I think one of the really, if, if, I was in, if I was in Rome, you know, or somewhere in the Mediterranean, uh, this is the species I would be really my priorities. This is Dilatris, uh, Dilatris ixioides, evergreen, perennial, very nice foliage, very long flowering period. It's just a super amazingly amazing plant, not in cultivation of the marker. Marco tells me his are just germinating. I've grown them in Sheffield, but you know they're a bit on the edge. I just not enough solar radiation, basically, but quite an easy plant to grow and very long lived. They form tussocks 30, 40, 50 years old, and you can just cut them off uh, and they resprout again. They are post-fire resprouter. Uh, so a, fan a fantastic species. And you know, and, and really one of the interesting things is when you collect lots of different populations of these, these are all young one-year dilatris. And, and the one on the the one on the right is uh, from a sandy population, and the one on the left is from a clay population. And in the cooler, wetter climate of, of, of Sheffield, the, the ones on the left are much better fitted. The the ones from clay populations. So again, sometimes plants are seem impossible to grow until you actually find the right population for your site. Um, um, okay, so coming to end the end now. Then we have got taller hummocks. So these these are now this is uh, so here this this is uh, the orange thing here is is Dimorphotheca cuneata about a meter tall but not a resprouter so when this is burned these die so you can prune them moderately severely but not very severely you know they're a bit like lavenders really uh, in that regard lavender is also a post fire reseeder uh, same sort of ecological strategy going on there. Um, but of course, there are things that are resprouted. So this is a very nice shrubby pusidanum. Uh, it's carrot family. They've got these nice, lovely foliage. This is just about six months after resprouting. But these form really nice domes, fly for a long period. Very, very beautiful architectural plant, this. I don't, I don't know the species name. Rod, Rod and Rachel did tell me, but I, I failed to write it down. Ah, duh. And this grew quite well in Sheffield, actually, I have to say. And then we get into some of the bigger bulbanellas, and these are really useful for as, as winter emergence. So this is the bulb. Oh, sorry, there's a spelling mistake. That that's a B rather than a D. Bulbanella latifolia, or latifolia. Uh, here, growing in swamps in the canvas. We're the big plant. This is a meter, one point two meters tall. Uh, very spectacular. Fly for a long time. Uh, I'm going to use this in my new house in South Somerset in actually a meadow because of, they're very very competitive these things, uh, even in Northern Britain. So absolutely cold tolerant for us. So th these things go to minus 12, minus 15 without any problems. Um, and then we have uh, just a few things you probably know, things like Aristea capitata, which is a very nice uh, Aristea, big tall Aristea, 1.2 meters. Very nice dwarf forms in South Africa too, down to about 750, but again, not in cultivation. And then Nifophia salmontosa, winter flowering Nifophia, uh, fun wet sites uh, in its habitat, which dry out in the summer. But flowers in Sheffield, this flowers from uh, about November all the way through to June. 
pretty much continuously a, a really really nice species which you know not not much cultivated and you know if you read the the rhs book on on knife opiates they says oh nothing nothing special about this but i don't know which what 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 they were what they were drinking on that particular day when they wrote that but anyway there you go uh, they don't know the plants in the wild um and then things like tetrarias these are terribly difficult to germinate they're get, trying to get these things to germinate they're monstrous monstrous to germinate but fantastic textures and colors uh if you can get them to work uh, you, you you almost need a research program to make that happen i think lunaria lunata is something that marco and myself like very much this is the evergreen herbaceous plant it has these wonderful cotton wool quite a big plant these the tussocks are about 300 to 600 tall and then the flowers go up to a meter uh, post fire uh, just extraordinarily wonderful fluffy sort of sort of flower heads but, but so difficult to get to germinate and some of these species i think some of these these are species of sandy soils and i think some of them are probably obligate mycorrhizals i.e they need probably to have a relationship with an a, with a with a fungi to actually be able to develop from seedlings and so they are incredibly difficult to grow but have a go if you can but they're not they're not it's not easy but perhaps someone would crack it if we if we tried oh and here's nifofia uh, somatosa in its habitat in sort of wet swaley environments and just a few other things just to finish on uh kind of very really um very nice crinum sm smallish crinum autumn flowering grows in running water on seasonal streams these these seasonal streams run during the winter months but then dry up in summer and in the habitat they flower in uh they, they look like this they flower in autumn uh with me they grow great in sheffield i have lots of them but they've yet to flower perhaps the bulbs aren't big enough perhaps they don't get the dry summer queue um you know uh but anyway this is a great species if you can obtain it it's very very nice about 600 750 in flower and with quite a small foliage rosette compared to some of our crinums uh aristea species very nice uh, this is aristea macrocarpa i think just after flowering is finished quite nice seed pods this is a year and a half after a fire so this is all new sort of fresh looking growth uh, the flowers look like that. Uh, very, very, very nice species. But I think probably the best Aristea is probably Aristea inequalis here growing in, in a nursery in, in San Francisco without any of the, the hideous black, uh, black disease. Uh, and this is another one that Marco's working with. But this flowers for a very long time. And this is a wonderful plant with slightly grayish green foliage. Fa fa fabulous plant. Should be everywhere. It endangered in its habitat so it would be good quite good to uh to be widely grown and uh, in our travels you know we found some really nice uh we found some really nice other uh, aristeas this is aristea monticola which has got very blue foliage uh high altitude so would have been cold tunnels but I'm, it's always just disappeared due to this bacterial blackening disease uh, and just to finish on, uh, again, go back to the Rhinosterveld and one of the really most striking species on this large statuesque scale is this. This is Brunsvigia josephinae. Uh, this has flower, a flower umbel about a, a meter across small, with red flowers. And the give you an idea of the size of this plant, this rosette is a meter across. And this is a plant well worth growing just for its foliage, but, you know, but the flowering structure is just extraordinary so i think that's me so uh, i'm going to stop sharing there so thank you very much for listening i hope that's whetted your appetite uh and i'm going to stop sharing and so sharing will go on gallery and then we can see everybody so i mean my introduction was slightly wrong i mean intrepid plant hunter is more the description for you i mean that was an amazing tour around these incredible environments and really I, I i mean i know south africa quite well and i felt like i've been there this evening um mm. oh, so thank you for sharing with us yeah, um, my pleasure these amazing slides um has anyone uh yvonne been on uh, asking questions on the chat perhaps
Um, yes, if I may be permitted before I launch into the chat to say um, uh, how welcome it is um, in the context of Mediterranean gardening to hear about the, the topics we never talk about, which is fire and winter cold, which yeah. certainly where I am in, in Umbria, in central Italy, are both extremely um, uh, major problems. Mm. Um, may I just ask you before we move on? Um, when you say fire, is, is the fire always generated through uh, meteorological events or is it man-made fire? Because he, here in central Italy, the, the fire brigade tells us that nearly all fire is created by man. It's, it's almost a, never uh, an accident. It's a mix. It's a mix. I mean, uh, I mean, very, it, it, you know, probably it's, if, if you're proximal to where a lot of people are, then it's probably mostly human, accidental human people mm. throwing cigarette butts out of out of cars it but there's a lot of lightning strikes too but you know so lightning strikes are pretty important as well particularly in remote areas and so you know even in the absence so the fire frequency in some areas is much higher than it used to be and that's problematic because these things need to have a window be able to recover and produce seed or whatever in between particularly proteas uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a it's a mixed bag actually. Um, bit of both, really. Hard to generalise. Mm, okay. Um, I mean, here here in Italy, we just wish that people didn't do it. It's <laughs> even yeah, sure. well, it's it's special for the plants. It, it doesn't. We we find it um, terrifying. Um, however, so, anyway, now just turning to the chat, the if I may, the uh, Nan Sturman in uh, in um, in California. Uh, is first of all mentions that in Protea um, um, uh, agriculturalists who grow flowers for uh, for market um, exploit this feature of the king Protea uh, when they're, they're um, mm. when they're growing the plants, and then she's gone on to ask. Uh, in California or America generally, where would do you know where she could buy this type of plant selection? Not, not well, Sil Sil Silver Hill Seed are still in business, and they the, and, and what happened is in Silver Hill Seed when after after Roman Rachel died, the 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 people who also ran well, it also worked for the company they took the company over, and they still have it as a as a as a as a going concern, but they don't have access to the diversity of species because they don't have Rod and Rachel anymore mm. who knew where everything was and a lot of their all of their locations for collection were in a GPS which was never retrieved when the people who killed them stole all, all their stuff oh. and it's never been found and so oh. this extraordinary collection of locations of all over South Africa from the north to the south, the east to the west, was all lost. Mm. Now, I, I, I was with them many times, so I know where some of the locations are, uh, but, but it's just there's no one to sort of do it. So when, when they died, really, a lot of that world died with them mm. in terms... So, so you can buy some... You can buy lots of stuff from Silver Hill Seed, but a lot of the more obscure stuff or more difficult to collect, stuff that might only flower after fire... You know, it, it's that they, they, they don't have the same capacity, but it's worth having mm. a look on their website and see what they have. Mm. You know, Thank they're you. Still sort of trundling along. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, Moira Thompson in, in Portugal says that she also gets the black um, disease on Aristea, but um, she's had more luck by, by just moving them into a different part of the garden with, mm. you know, from, from seed. And it's just trial and error, really. Um, she found it, it it works. Um, quite a few people are just writing what a wonderful presentation, how stunning and inspiring you've been. So um, I, I'll leave you to read read the the uh, the, I'll the chat. I'll well. <laughs> um, Oh, uh, now uh, Richard Turner, I don't know where he is, has asked: um, uh, Have you found that the native UK pollinators are attracted to the composites from South Africa? Yeah, they seem to be. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they do. I mean, well, you know, they, they, in my other life as, because, you know, I have fingers and lots of pies and one of them is a, quite a strong interest in pollinator and plant interactions. And, you know, from the work that's been done in the UK, you know, most native pollinators are fairly generalist. 
uh, in the, in Western Europe. So <laughs> you know they so they tend to they simply follow the resources. So if the resources are acceptable and there's enough protein in the pollen and if there's enough sh sugar content in the nectar and if mm -hmm. the flower has the right structure for their morphological form, then they just jump ship, you know? So, and, and I mean, one of the really interesting things is South African species, of course, have, there's a lot of research in South Africa on how specialized the pollination mechanisms of South African species are uh and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but but when you take south african species outside of south africa they seem to be pretty damned attractive to many generalist pollinators in northwestern europe or the northern europe in europe in general type thing so i think you know i, I think you know there, there there's a there's a degree of flexibility there basically so yeah i you sh i don't think you should see these things as ecologically having no value for invertebrates, that certainly isn't the case in, in the main. Well, that's jolly good news for us. I, that, that's great. We, <laughs> no, no, we, 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 we do worry about introducing exotics, you know, for the very reason that the questioner was asking. Well, there's a lot of literature on this now. If you look at the, if you look at the British, if you get, if you look on Google Scholar and you, you just put in pollinators, uh, natives and exotics, UK, You'll find a whole literature now which shows very conclusively that this idea that only native, only native mm. plants support native pollinators is, is tosh, basically. Mm. Excellent. Um, right, I've got another couple of questions, if I may. Um, uh, first of all, first of all um, uh, Francoise Murat says, um, could you please spell the nursery name for Rod and Rachel Saunders? Because we're, we're, we're all trying to write it down. Yeah, well, I'll put some on the chat. Hang on a minute. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. I know, mate. Uh, okay, Silver Hill Seeds. So if you just type that into, into Google, you'll, you'll find them. Super. Thank you. Um, now, now, Susan Brooks, who is also in Central Italy, um, she's asking if we could just go back to this question of fire. Do you think we ought to be just looking at it differently, different angle? Well, I mean, you know, look, the, 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 real, the reality is that, you know, well, Southern Europe's a bit of a, so, so, Southern Europe's an odd bod, isn't it? Because, you know, your the biota of Southern Europe is very different to what it was pre the classical civilization, because the classical civilization massively changed the, the Mediterranean bowl. Um, so you would have had fire would have been far less frequent historically in the past in most of the Mediterranean basin, but when it was then converted from forest to Fregana, Maquis and all this sort of stuff, then you had a much more flammable vegetation. Uh, so we've got this, we've got that in the background going on, but in the main in Mediterranean ecosystems, this, the, this, the cycle of plant, if you, to maintain biodiversity, you have to have fire because the successional patterns are circular as opposed to linear. So what happens is, is you have a fire event, you have a lot of species after the fire because all the receders and all of the sprouters are present. And then the number of species in the natural systems declines and declines and declines over time from the fire event. And if there is no fire, then you end up with very impoverished communities dominated by a few of the key shrubby or woody dominants. Okay, and so you lose everything. That's a general background. So, so the problem is how do people live in these environments with fire? It's not that fire is fire is really important for the plants and for the ecosystems to proceed, but it's really difficult for us because we when we live in these environments, and that's that's the that's the challenge, isn't it? That's the very difficult situation. So mm -hmm. I think we do need to look at it differently. And certainly, you know, if if you, I mean, if you're in Greece, for example, one of the reasons why Greece has a major fire problem is because the forest has insisted on planting pines, mm. you know, which are highly flammable. If, if they planted broadleafed species, which are far less flammable and far less resin rich, then mm. you wouldn't have these boom bust things. But, you know, but that's part of the culture of Greek forestry, you know. Um, and if we go back to the, the Mediterranean before Greek foresters and before the classical civilizations, pines would have probably been quite rare in these ecosystems and therefore fires would have been less frequent. So I think it's about having a bigger picture and it's the same in California and everything else. You know, these, these issues are all about where do you put development? You know, a bit like in the UK, our big issue is not fire. Our big issue is putting houses on floodplains. Mm. 
you know, that's what we do. We put houses on floodplains and then we all moan about how terrible it is when there's floods. But we, <laughs> as a society, we just, we just aren't able to, you know, get our heads around this. And in, in California, a lot of places, people, or a lot of the measure, people put houses where you really shouldn't in a fire ecosystem put houses. Exactly. Unfortunately, we, we, we're we ashamed to admit that the uh, the um, uh, the Andrangheta um, destroyed don't know how many hectares of ancient beach woodland in the in the uh, the sealer of, of Calabria last year mm. out of sheer uh, what in an act of extortion and and, and mafia. So, mm, you know, yeah. um, well, that's very um, sad, isn't it? I Mm. And that happens in South Africa as well. There's a lot of political fires in the Western Cape. They oh, say. Mm. Yeah, set by... Well, there, is in, there yeah. is in Greece too. A lot of a lot of fire historically in Greece has been people who want to develop property and therefore you exactly. lose the reputation. And the planning, because the planning rules are so chaotic historically mm. there. Um, That's very much the case in Southern Italy. Absolutely. Um, uh, on to a slightly brighter note. Um, uh, Emma Bannister is asking you... Um, what were the South African species that worked well in the London Olympic planting? Mm -hmm. uh, the South African species that we used, we, we, yeah, because we did these big, we did this big, oh, I did this big South African garden. There were four, four main gardens and uh, one of them was the South African garden, but it was all basically Eastern Cape species. Uh, with there were a few there were a few restios in it there were a few Western Cape restios but mostly it was South African grassland species so it's stuff like uh, red grass and uh, nifophias and agapanthas and watsonias uh, and all these species work very well and and you know do um, uh, so they you know they're entirely viable. Um, but again, the, the issue is when you come to use these plants on large scales, because we're talking about thousands of square meters here for these, mm. sort of, you know, when it, the difficulty was, and the difficulty was, we've just done a re, we've just done a rehash, like a redesign of working with the existing just to pep it up again after 10, 10 years. And the difficulty is just, just obtaining these plants in, in volume. You know, it's really yeah. very difficult. A lot of nurseries, you know, they, they just don't have a very good range and, you know, they're mostly all hybrids, you can't find the So for example, if you try to buy Dilatrus ixioides in the UK, impossible. So what do you do? Where do you, how do you source such things? Well, I've, I've, I've sourced those either through networks uh, of people in the botanical world or uh, through um, um, historically with working with people like Ron, Ron Rachel really, but there's a huge problem. I mean, you know, in most of the world, because we now have the CBD or the final provisions of the Conventional Biological Diversity, it basically makes, you know, it's essentially an illegal act for people to collect seeds in mm -hmm. another nation state uh, without, without permission from the, the relevant state authorities. So, so what's happened in the world is all access to the natural biota has been diminished nation states are meant to provide reasonable access through through a permit like a permitting system but most nation states don't because you know they it's a cost well, to them so yeah. they don't do it and they're not very interested in doing that so there's been this huge in the last 20 years there's been this huge contraction in access to by, by genetic material and the, the final provisions of the treat of the of the the CBD came in in 2014. So after 2014, it essentially was a criminal act to collect. So, so that's a really problem. And you know, in the UK, I'm quite active in trying to poke people like Q to say, well, because you know, when Q collects genetic material through their various collaborations and connections all over the world, they have chosen to put a clause in there saying they will never commercialize the material. Uh -huh. And this has been done to protect the property rights that the CBD mm. gives to nation states mm. and probably out of post-colonial guilt on the part of Q. And, and so I'm, I'm having a conversation with them. Well, why do you do that? Because, you know, what, why would it be a bad thing to allow commercialization? And most nation states realize there's not a lot of money to be realized here. This is peanuts. Mm. So the CBD was developed to prevent big pharma from mining the genetic resources of third world countries. Mm. But it was never intended to stop people having access to say South African or Southern European flora, that we just got swept up in the big picture. 
and no one's ever challenged it. No one's ever said, well, so if you, if you go to Gothenburg, for example, when they collect uh, Gothenburg Botanic Gardens, they simply put a clause in to say, we'd like to commercialize the material in some cases. Are you OK with that? And everyone just says, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's Q has chosen through its exis- excessive zealousness to actually say so so literally you know places like Edinburgh Botanic Garden they collect say South Africa, they say they collect New Guinea rain uh, cloud forest epiphytes and when the, they finish the botanical study they throw them all in the skip because it's all about me it's all about them and when you say to them don't you think that's a little bit wouldn't it be better to and they say oh no we signed the CBD doesn't allow us to allow us to pass this material on to anyone. So we're in a slightly wacky world and the Botanic Gardens have a lot to answer for, to be honest, on actually this constriction, because from their point of view, they have access. So why does anyone else need access? Mm-hmm. But they, no one else can get access from them because they've all signed these restricted clauses which don't allow them to commercialize. So this is why we're in the world we're in. Literally nothing in Q can ever go over that wall. So but presumably, you don't realize this is how the world is, but this is this is what's going on. Mm, it's fascinating. I mean, as as obviously our climates change and stuff, we're going to need new stuff. Exactly, so it's the worst time take... possible mm. to actually have to restrict access to genetic material, and yet this is what we've done, and no one really understood the consequences. Well, is it is it it it, it requires action? Presumably, I mean, well, is I it... think what it requires is it requires. I mean, the, the way to try to resolve this would be for the world's botanic gardens to simply say, well, you know, the presumption of non-commercialization, you know, really who benefits from that? You know, what, you know, and, and, and if, if nation states do actually need access to genetic material, I mean, if you're a potato researcher or a commercial potato producer, there's a thing called the International Potato G- G- Gene Bank. You go along to the gene bank and you say, I want that population, population 16C from the Bolivian plateau. Uh, you pay your money, you get the genes. But we don't have anything like that in the ornamental world. And in the way I think to do this would be for botanic gardens to, to begin to think about their presumptions of non-commercialization. And then secondly, they would be in the position to talk to other countries and to the CBD about saying mm, we never really thought about this but we've got climate change we need new genes and we made it we've made it really hard so a lot of people in universities are complaining about this because they can't get access to scientific material for scientific research mm-hmm. there are even taxonomists writing how what a disaster the cbd has been for taxonomic <laughs> research mm-hmm. yeah. and where but does it ha- reside where does the cbd the CBD offices are in, um, uh, I think they're in uh, Montreal, it's a sort of UN organization, and it was really, it was, it was part of the Earth Summit back in ni- the early 90s, and, it, it, and it, that the idea was it would protect, it would give title, legal titles, it was done by property lawyers, basically. Mm. And, and if you write to them and say, oh, you know, China doesn't allow access to any of this material, even though it's got, it's signed a bit of paper saying, um, oh, we would give reasonable access in return for legal title protection. They just say, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so that's it, isn't it? So it's something which needs a conversation. And, um, but I don't think you're going to get much you know, you have to see it in the context. The Americans never signed it because they knew they were the target. Mm. So the Americans said, I don't think so. So most other countries in the world did out of a sense of doing the right thing. So, you know, you can't argue some of the principles. All we need is we just need to have some nuance so that there's some mechanisms to make it a little bit easier, either through botanic national botanic gardens or whatever, to get an assistant genetic material. It's, it's not a... It's, I'm, I'm not arguing for some sort of like, per, per, you know, bio pirate free for all. No, but I mean, I think also, I mean, that one of the, the prevalent um, preoccupations at the moment is where we are seeing um, pest and disease sure. come in yeah. through 
commercial importation of stuff. So I think we're, you know, there's probably a, we're in a well, high state of alarm. And there is, there is, of course, obviously everywhere. And that's a, that's a genuine issue. But of course, that the issue is not in seed. No. Mm-hmm. The risk of actually pest and disease transfer in seed is extremely low. The risk is actually in the standard nursery industry when you move plants and growing media and soil as living organisms. If you, you know, if you went silver hill seed, say you used to send seed out, it was all fumigated in methyl bromide. And so there was nothing living came with it. Yeah. So we need a change in the in the way that we ship yeah. stuff. We don't need well, instant plants. You know, we need to. No, I get... mean the risk. The, the real risk is moving. You know, and the larger the plants, the more ecosystem you move with them, type thing. But seed really should be should really be in a separate separate category because it's quite easy to minimise the risk to the level in which there's really really likely to be no risk at all. Yeah. Well, could I just chip in and say that the Mediterranean Garden Society does try very hard. We have a wonderful seed bank and anybody who's a member of the MGS is entitled to uh, exchange seeds and or, or, or obtain seeds from uh, Chantal Guiro in, uh, in the south of France, who has a, a, a huge catalogue and uh, also shares the seed bank of Chateau Perouse uh, in, in the south of France, uh, which um, we you know, we're always alert to problems on, you know, restrictions on, on uh, yeah. moving seeds across boundaries, but we do our best and we feel that's our, one way of our, you know, doing our best for, for diversity of, of plants mm-hmm. within the organisation. Yeah, it's a, look, these are really difficult. These are difficult issues. I mean, and, and there aren't, there aren't you know, very neat solutions, you know. Uh, some Some countries have more rational approaches and some countries have very... Have more, have, have more restrictive, you know, sometimes unnecessarily restrictive and sometimes justifiably restrictive. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's really a, a huge topic area yeah. uh, in itself. But I, I think it's just, I'm just trying to, you know, my, my job is one of my roles in the world is to throw pebbles into ponds and try to create some ripples. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's a sort of, you know, if you look in the horticultural in, if you look at sort of like organising like the RHS in the UK, I mean they, you know, they're not really interested in going there. You know, they they just like don't want to talk about that. You know, because they feel reputational damage. You know, um, and that's and that's really problematic. And Q historically isn't want to talk about it. Although I, I gave a talk at Q a few months ago, and and, and I you know I know the senior people at Q, and we. You know, like a discussion about this, and yeah, and they they saying, well, yeah, you know, we are beginning to think perhaps, you know, perhaps this is this is this is a rather necessary, you know, perhaps we could be playing a role more in terms of diversity. I mean, one of the interesting things about the seed bank, you know, all the seed in the Millennium Seed Bank, this much trumpeted thing, you know, it's all covered by the CBD. So if you want to actually utilize some of the genes in there, I don't know how you're going to you, you can't commercialize them. So what the hell have we got the seed bank for? Mm-hmm. It's really designed to give to university academics to do work on, and there's only one genotype of nearly all the species in there, so that's pretty useless anyway in terms of conservation biology. So why do we, you know? So if you're gonna if you're gonna have you know if you're gonna have useful ecologically useful seed banks, you don't want to have me representing Homo sapiens. <laughs> you know that would be a, what a bummer that would be. You know. You wouldn't, you know, you'd want a, a slightly broader range of genes than the stuff sitting in me. And, and yet that's what we have in a lot of these seed banks because they've made political commitments to, to, to the number of species rather than having, say, 100, 100 accessions. Uh, I, just, just bear with me a second. I've got a call. John, I just need to pick this up. One second. Okay, so is there anybody who'd like, has, have, we, have you finished the questions on the chat? Shall we, is there anyone we else? Have like pretty well, I would just mention that Elizabeth Filiotis, who I presume is in Greece, um, mentioned, points out that the uh, most of Greek um, uh, landscape was in fact oak uh, in, in antiquity. So the, the, the pine trees that we're talking about in the modern day are, are, are very much an aberration. And um, okay. Has anybody else, would anybody like to actually ask something in person or? Uh, 
no. I think we're, okay. I think we're done. I think you've you've <laughs> stunned us, yeah. <laughs> Well, it was it was really good, and I think it really interesting to hear about some of these more uh, spiky, um, oh. problematic um, issues on the, on the big stage. Um, really, yes. really, really fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much. And shall yeah. we be, can we book to come and see this Somerset Garden? Uh, you can, but it's just a big field at the moment. No, I know, but I mean, <laughs> so how long do you reckon? What do you think? Five, ten? Five well, I'm, you know, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty ancient, so I've got to get moving because I might be dead soon. Um, so um, I guess I, I think, I think in about five years, you know, it'll begin to be doing its, it'll begin to look something like what it said on the tin. It'd be nice to see what you start off with. And then yeah, see yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I am, um, I am. Well, I'm, I'm giving a talk tomorrow night. So if you look at my Instagram page. Uh, I'm giving a talk on, you know, about leaving the university because I'm, I'm, I'm retiring this September. So I'm doing my sign off talk tomorrow night yeah. in person and the university and it'll be it'll be live streamed. And there's a link if you go to my if you go to my bio uh, in on my Instagram page, you can just click on it. It's 1820 and you will see you'll see what the what it looks like and you'll see the, the old schematic design for it. If you want to, exactly. if you want to log into that. So what time is that in the UK then, James? Eighteen twenty. Eighteen twenty-six. Okay, eighteen. Yeah, GMT. PM. James, I, if I go by your old garden with a trowel, will there be? Uh... Uh, I've been doing that, John. So uh, you'll have to compete with me. And uh, although I've only taken the the specials, you know, like. What did you say is the address again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not telling you. <laughs> It, well, it looked better. There was one photo, beautiful. Uh, I don't know if that was the university garden or it was your Sheffield garden. There was one very, very colourful, uh, beautiful okay. slide there. Uh, oh, yeah, the one with the... Well, yeah, that's my place. Yeah, that's that's with the, the gladiolus in, yes. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah so, yeah. It still looks all right. I haven't pinched everything. I'm not some sort of... <laughs> I haven't... You know, these people are going to rock up and there's... there's <laughs> Burnt, burnt, torched her. Okay, super. Well, well, that's a date for the future at some stage, or, or, or even for tomorrow evening for for some of us. So, um, once again, thank you for this lovely, lovely presentation. Fascinating. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks, See everybody. You Cheers. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. See you next month. <laughs>